Welcome to The Policy Shop, weekly conversations with public policy experts where we'll dive into the most important issues affecting all of us here in Illinois. I'm Hillary Gowans. Let's get started. Joining me today is Adam Schuster, Senior Director of Budget and Tax Policy at the Illinois Policy Institute. The biggest financial crisis facing Illinois is its public pension system. But what many people don't realize is that the local pension crisis is just as dire as the state's pension crisis. And it's driving up property taxes and crowding out the services we all value. Adam will break down what's going on and why it matters to you. Adam, thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. It's nice to see you. I know you had kind of an epic journey on Thanksgiving. Can you tell me what happened? Because I've seen some pictures, but I don't quite know (laughs) what happened to you. Sure. So uh, we drive to Arizona uh, around the holidays. We we switch off visiting my fiance's parents and mine for the uh, holiday. And uh, on our two-day drive to Arizona, um, on our way going through New Mexico, Jenna got some kind of notification on her phone. That's my fiance about uh, some kind of accident. Uh, and it turned out to be, there was, there was, I think, a fatal crash, uh, you know, like way up the road, way up uh, uh, 40 from us. But it turned into a record setting traffic jam that delayed us by like, I want to say like six or seven hours. Um, at one point that news reporters were saying there was 30 miles of stopped traffic on the road. So more than 30 miles of just no movement uh, with the cars. And yeah, we had to uh, end up, we drove as long as we could, tried to get through all the the craziness. Um, but, you know, we were going to try to push through and make it to Arizona. We were originally supposed to get there that night, um, ended up just crashing at a motel at about 3 a.m. You know, they, it was it was really crazy, though. They had uh, police barricades up at all, like the little towns a- around the highway, because they didn't want people, you know, getting off the highway, going into all these towns. And so they closed to non-visitors. But it's a crazy uh, holiday story. Uh, not quite as crazy as last year when my windshield got hit by a turkey, but... <laughs> about that what's up with you at thanksgiving i don't i we think our our drive to arizona is just cursed we can't make it in two days something has to delay us so i wonder what it'll be next year well i'm glad you you made it you look just fine for all the the travel you had to endure um so now let's talk about a light subject we always talk about illinois public pension crisis and we usually focus on the state level but you and i have been talking a lot about the local problem that we face here in Illinois and that governments across the state are dealing with. And I was hoping that we could dive into that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I uh, own a home here in the Chicago suburbs every year, uh, twice a year, we get the property tax bill and you just groan because it always goes up. Um, and I think that there's this temptation to get really frustrated, wondering what your local government officials have done to cause this spike. But the reality is that it's not necessarily the local mayors or village boards fault. Isn't that right? That's right. So I don't I don't want to take uh, all responsibility off of local officials for property taxes, um, because there are many decisions they make around bond debt and different you know, road funding and all those types of things. But the primary driver of our property taxes and the primary driver of all of the budget problems that our local governments face uh, is pension debt. Um, and when it comes to pension debt, uh, there's really sort of a, a, I call it fiscal handcuffs. There's a pair of fiscal handcuffs on mayors that force them uh, to make this, this impossible choice of either cutting municipal services beyond, you know, to, to below the level that people want and need, or hiking property taxes uh, above what people can actually afford. And those are the only options left to the mayors because um, a lot of people don't realize this, but not only does the state constitution say that pension benefits can never be diminished or impaired, but both the benefits for local pensions, how much people get, and the contribution policy, how much mayors have to pay into the pension funds, are set by state law. Uh, so pensions are the largest budget category for almost every local government, and they have virtually no control over it. So let's back up a little bit and e- explain to listeners how the local public pension system works because it's it's a little different from what people might assume you know they don't they might not know what the fund is called they might not understand what this funding requirement actually is and how it's different from the state public pension systems requirements so can you talk to us about how the local pension system works 
Sure. So uh, our state pension systems, there's five of them. It's for teachers, state workers, judges, university employees, and politicians. Those state systems have about $144 billion in debt. We also have more than 650 local pension systems. Um, there's the Chicago and the Cook County pension systems. And then there's uh, IMRF or the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, which is for city workers outside of Chicago. Uh, and then that, that covers every city. So IMRF is a, is a consolidated fund for all municipal workers, but for police officers and firefighters, each town has its own pension fund. So there's a, that's where the, the bulk of the 650 number comes from is all these uh, small to mid-sized police and fire pension funds. Collectively, those local pension systems have about another 75, $76 billion in debt, according to official state reports. So on average, the average uh, Illinois family has about $45,000 uh, in pension debt because of those two systems. It's $219 billion in debt when, when you add them together. Um, as for how they're funded, again, that, that funding policy is set at the state level. So the way pensions work is we basically try to figure out how much have we promised people? How much will we have to pay out in the future over X number of years? And then we try to set aside enough today that with investments, the money will grow to that amount, right? Um, and the, the state sets a contribution policy. And for local pension systems, they say you have to try to reach 90% funding by the year 2040. Um, that is earlier than the funding date for either the state pension systems or the Chicago pension systems. The state pension systems are 2045 and the Chicago systems are 2055. Okay, so that's sort of the mechanics of how local pensions work. Um, now, the funding requirements being different is a big point of contention among local officials, I know, uh, because that just puts more pressure on them to make those payments and, you know, make tough decisions earlier than other people might have to make them in Chicago or at the state level. So let's talk about those difficult decisions in cities like Peoria and other places where the pension crisis has just spiraled out of control. So what's happening in cities with massive local pension crises and what are some actual examples of the things that those cities are being forced to do to deal with it? Yeah, so I'll start general and then I'll, I'll give you those, those examples. But generally speaking, the pension crisis is forcing Illinois taxpayers to pay more and more to their government and getting less and less back from it in return. So they're paying more and getting less. Um, and that's because uh, despite the fact that we have the most pension debt in the nation, we also spend the most on pensions as a percentage of our state and local revenue. Um, and it's, it's sort of like throwing money down a black hole we cannot keep up with this problem by throwing money at it. It's just the math doesn't work. The only way to do it um, is, is to, to actually uh, re reform the, these pension systems. Um, but because uh, we throw um, money at it like we do, it's, it's a, a, a rising portion of the budget. Uh, it's the primary uh, driver behind rising property taxes. More than 50% of the increase in taxes over the last 20 years can be uh, attributed to pensions. And, you know, when mayors are left with this choice of, I, I have to fund this, the state says, I have to fund it. Uh, I can't change the benefits. Um, they only can cut services or, or, or hike taxes. And many cities have done both. They've both uh, hiked property taxes specifically to pay for pensions and had to do things like um, you know, uh, sell off their city water systems, lay off police officers and firefighters today, lay off municipal workers, street sweepers, uh, snow plowers, things like that today in order to make these pension payments. Uh, just, just a couple examples, Peoria in 2018, they had to eliminate 38 first responder jobs as police officers and firefighters, 27 municipal workers. After COVID-19, they had to eliminate an additional 45 jobs. They're reportedly still trying to figure out um, how to make their budget work. They, they had implemented a special property tax fee for pensions uh, that they just got rid of, and now they're trying to figure out uh, how to make the funding work without it. Uh, Rockford in 2019 uh, was told by a consulting company that in order to fund their pension systems, uh, it, actually in order to avoid running out of money in their pension systems within five years, they needed to eliminate 40 sworn police officers 
uh, close down a fire station, freeze all city wages, and, and sell their water system. And if you go you know, around the state, there's a bunch of other examples of this. Um, layoffs, um, there's towns that actually have sold off uh, their municipal water systems. Um, you know, these are the types of things that, are, that these cities are doing as they're also implementing special taxes and fees to pay for pensions. It's like being on a sinking boat and you've got a bucket and you're trying to shovel out water, but you can't ever stop the water because there's a hole in the bottom of the boat. I just, I can't believe the kinds of things that local governments are facing and getting the blame at the same time for people, you know, seeing their property taxes go up. I can't believe that we're talking about firing more and more police and fire and cutting back on street and sanitation services. And, and I, one thing that you found in Chicago that I thought was really interesting um, was related to their fire department. And I think the stat was something like uh, Chicago ends up paying for two fire systems, the, the firefighters that the city actually employs, and then an equal cost to cover city pensions for firefighters. Is that right? You know, I, I don't uh, have the stat specifically in my head, so I don't know if it's the exact same amount, but it would not surprise me. These are huge, huge costs. Um, and the city of Chicago's public safety pension systems are among the worst in the state. They only have 18, 19 cents on the dollar saved uh, for how much they've made in promises. Um, there's other places where it's it's close to as bad. There's about 20 cities that have uh, funding ratios below 50 meaning they have less than 50% of the money that they've promised uh, set aside today. Um, but Chicago is, is certainly, um, you know, among the worst. They have, just the city of Chicago's taxpayers uh, are on the hook for as much pension debt as, or more pension debt than 44 states have. So entire states. So this is just one city and the city by itself has more pension debt than 44 states. So you have this really interesting graphic in a, a report you published recently on the local pension crisis. And the, the chart does something I think people should really look at. It talks about how pension debt drives up property taxes. And so you look at these really distressed cities um, and you, you talk about, okay, well, what's the percentage of your property taxes that actually go toward pensions? Um, and it, it's pretty startling. So, you know, cities like um, Danville, for example, 102% of their property taxes are, are getting paid toward pensions. How does that even work? How do you pay more than 100% of your property taxes toward pensions? Yeah, so I, the, the initial idea was just to show people how much of their property taxes get, uh, go, to, go to pensions in some places. It's more than everything they collect in property mm -hmm. taxes. Uh, and, you know, so any number that's above 100% means that they throw every dollar, every resident pays in property taxes immediately goes to the pension system. And then they also have to take additional money from, you know, sales tax or uh, fees that are imposed locally uh, and add that in. And what's really scary is that, you know, you mentioned Rockford and, and some of the scary things that they're facing just to avoid running out of money in their local pension system. They're not even the worst on this list. They've got they're throwing 38% of their property tax dollars at pensions. So if if that's what the situation looks like for Rockford, I mean, what in the world does a city closer to where we are, let's see, we've got Melrose Park, 132% uh, of, of what you pay in property taxes. So like you said, not just property taxes, all the property taxes you pay, but other revenue sources. What does that mean if, 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 like we said, if Rockford's facing this dire situation and they're not even as close to some of these other cities um, in terms of how, how skewed the, the property tax spending is? You know, I, I think what it means is that uh, the pension crisis is so severe and has been festering for so long with inaction, from our, with no action from our politicians to fix it. Um, you know, that it's really reached crisis levels. And sometimes people quibble with the word pension crisis. You know, there's people who've said you shouldn't call it a crisis, but this is absolutely a crisis. And, and really it was probably a crisis 10 years ago, uh, you know, after the great recession. Um, and today it's even worse, right? So the, the fact that uh, Rockford might have to 
freeze all city wages, lay off a bunch of police and fire, sell its city water system. And it's not even the worst city, right? There's places that have already had to do those things. There's places that have already sold their city water system that have already done, you know, dozens of layoffs uh, and, and, and things like that. So, you know, I think this should just be a wake up call for people that mayors need help, taxpayers need help, our cities are, you know, are struggling and sinking uh, under this un unaffordable debt burden. Um, and, you know, the, the crisis doesn't happen when the pensions run out of money, and we can't pay employees anymore. The crisis happens when the funding streams have gotten, you know, uh, so strained that we're, that we're asking people to pay more and get less, right? And that's why people are leaving Illinois. It's, if you pay really high taxes, there are other really high tax states, right? California, for example, Minnesota, um, where you don't see the same levels of out migration as you see in Illinois. Why don't people wanna move here? Why are so many people leaving here? It's because their property tax bills keep going up, but they're not getting better parks. They're not getting better schools. They're not getting better roads. They're just seeing it thrown after pension debt as their services actually decrease. Um, so you know, I, what we hope this report does is wake Springfield up for, for the need for real action. So get us out of the crisis. And I know that you talk about this solution all the time, but it bears repeating. What does it take to help mayors and help taxpayers and ultimately secure the retirement of all of these government workers? The only way to do it is to amend Illinois' constitution to allow for pension reform uh, to where the problem lies. So uh, we already implemented something called tier two in 2011, which means employees hired after 2011 uh, pay more into their pensions and they get less generous pensions uh, back in return. Um, but tier two uh, didn't really touch the problem because the debt was for people hired before 2011. So virtually all of the problem, all of the financial strain is with these tier one employees, people hired um, before 2011. The only way the only legal way that we can make changes to those benefits is to amend the constitution. The current pension clause um, says that, that they're a contract, they can't be diminished or impaired, and our courts have read that clause to mean even future benefits cannot be diminished or impaired. So not what you've already earned for work that you've already performed, but how fast your benefit grows on a going forward basis is also locked in place as of the first day you were hired. Um, it's an absurd situation. The current pension clause has enabled things like a substitute teacher, or sorry, rather a union lobbyist who worked a single day as a substitute teacher, um, got a full pension through a loophole in state law, and the court said, you can't take that away because of the pension clause. So if we want to be able to, you know, uh, scale back on abuses, if we want to be able to do things like change the 3% compounding post-retirement raise um, that, that pensioners get so that it's something tied to inflation so that it rises with the cost of living, but not faster than that, not faster than taxpayers can afford, the only way to do it is to amend the constitution. In order for that to happen, um, the General Assembly, both the House and the Senate in Illinois, need to pass an amendment to the ballot with three-fifths votes of both houses, and then uh, it needs to be approved by voters at the ballot box to take effect. If we were to do that, we could implement um, reforms that we call hold harmless pension reform because it preserves every dollar earned um, for work already performed. No retiree sees their check get smaller. Uh, no current worker sees their currently promised pension shrink. It just changes how fast the benefits grow on a going forward basis. That's good for taxpayers. It's good for mayors. It's good for people who rely on these government services that are being cut. And ultimately, it's good for that worker themselves. Because if you could take a small haircut to how fast your pension grows, but have certainty that it will be there, rather than you know us making an empty promise that it's gonna to continue to grow at this absurd rate when the pensions don't have enough money to actually pay out at that rate, um, it's actually a win-win, I think. And other states, even blue states, have tackled this problem in the past. So I think that you know this concern that there's no political will you can overcome that by looking to what other blue states like California, like New Mexico, what with what they've been able to do. What have what have other blue states been able to do to solve their pension problems? So New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Minnesota, Michigan, um, 
Utah, there are many states that have implemented reforms to make their pension systems more solvent. Now, exactly the type of reform that you need depends on exactly the problem that you have, right? You, you need to have the diagnosis before you know the cure, um, but they've largely done the same types of changes that we want here. So in these states, they've done things like um, replace uh, uh, permanent raises, which, you know, a, a benefit increase that a pensioner gets that isn't tied to inflation shouldn't be called a cost of living increase uh, or a cost of living adjustment because you're not adjusting for cost of living. Cost of living is measured by inflation. And if it's not, you know, so um, other states have done things like replace permanent raises with cost of living adjustments, um, slightly raise retirement ages for younger workers. Um, do things like set the contributions so that there, there's more of an even split between taxpayers um, and the, the employee themselves. Because in Illinois, there's this, there's this misconception that, uh, you know, pensioners have paid in their half and, you know, taxpayers haven't put in their half or the state hasn't put in their half. Uh, but the reality is, is that we're funding, you know, taxpayers are funding about 75% uh, of the pension contributions. So making changes to, you know, level that out a little bit so that, you know, the amount that employees paying out of their own paycheck more reasonably covers a, a, a share of their benefit. These are the types of changes that other states have made. Uh, Arizona even had almost an identical pension clause to what Illinois had. And similarly to what happened in Illinois, they tried to pass reforms statutorily, meaning just a regular law. Um, those reforms were not permitted because of their pension clause. So in Illinois, the same thing happened. And we said, oh, the pension clause says we can't do reform. And we just sat on our hands for a decade and said, well, there's nothing we can do. Uh, in Arizona, they said, oh, well, then let's change that clause, right? Which is the reasonable response. Um, and they did so with the support of public sector unions. And they amended their constitution twice uh, to allow for those types of reforms with the support of public sector unions, because in Arizona, as in Minnesota, as in many of these other states, unions supported the pension reform because they realized that without reform, there's a real risk that, that these people are going to get nothing, that there won't be benefits there for them. That's my favorite part of the Arizona story. And there are other examples of unions and other stakeholders coming together in states like California and other places. I, I think that that's the most encouraging message from all of this is that when you look at this problem, neutrally. I don't understand how you can come to any other conclusion than retirements for government sector workers are in serious threat or there's a serious threat to them. Taxpayers are, are, are tapped out. And as you always say, the math just doesn't work for making the systems whole under the current paradigm. Like this structure just will never work. And so if you really are able to look at the problem Honestly, I don't understand how you can have any other outcome than what you saw in Arizona, where unions and lawmakers and other stakeholders come together at a table and say, look, what do we do? Let's work together. And I, I hope that that's what we can get to here in Illinois. I really hope it is too. You know, I, I have the same feeling as you. It's a bizarre and very frustrating problem that we have, which is that our unions are more militant and more dishonest on this issue than they have been anywhere else. Uh, you know, like you said, I mean, virtually every state that has done this uh, has had union buy-in. In, in Minnesota, the, the legislative director for AFSCME, um, which is the largest uh, uh, state and local government employee union, said that they supported reform because they realized without it, the threat of insolvency was a bigger risk, you know, to the benefits for, for their employees. Why, why cannot Illinois unions understand that same logic when our problem is worse than any of those other states' problems? Um, you know, and, you know, you, you were talking earlier about the lack of political will. I mean, that's kind of just another way of saying politicians don't want to do it, right? I mean, why don't our politicians want to do it? There was, uh, there was an effort to reform pensions in 2013 that passed through a supermajority controlled democratic legislature. So the idea that, you know, it can't happen here is, is wrong. It's happened in other states that have similar political makeup and demographic makeup. And it's happened in Illinois within the last decade. It's just our court said no. So now we need to go back to the drawing board, amend the constitution and come, with a, come up with a plan that, that passes constitutional muster. We've done that. And it's not as if it's, you know, I mean, in my opinion, particularly hard to do, um, you know, it's just that there's, there's no will, there's no, uh, there's, there's been a, a lack of, of seriousness 
frankly, fr from our politicians and a lack of seriousness from the unions. There's this narrative out there um, that the pension funds will be fine. And all we have to do is to keep spending 25% of our budget for the next 30 years on pensions, which already sounds unacceptable to me, but all we have to do is spend 25% of our budget for 30 years on pensions and they'll be fine. And it's just not true. Uh, and you know, so I don't know uh, what it will take to wake up the politicians in Springfield to the seriousness of this, but I think the people of Illinois are already awake to it. Yeah, if I can make a plea to all the public sector union leaders out there, please, I have friends who are public school teachers. I want them to have a, a retirement and not have to work until they're 85. So let's work together. I think that's the message here. It has to get done. Uh, Adam, thank you as always for breaking down this problem and for pointing to positive solutions. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.